Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Trevor Cates. Welcome to the Spa Doctor Show where we talk about health tips and strategies to help you be smart, sexy, and strong. On today's show, I have as my guest, Kathy Smith. They call Kathy Smith a fitness revolutionary for a reason. She has stood on the forefront of the fitness and health industries for over 30 years with a collection of best-selling books, DVDs, audios, and exercise equipment. Kathy has sold more than 20 million exercise DVDs, landing her in the Video Hall of Fame. Recently, she has an online weight loss program called Reshape Your Body that com combines downloadable workouts, food plans, shopping lists, and hundreds of recipes, and a new book and DVD, Fast Fit, Fast Fit that addresses that belly fat epidemic and blood sugar roller coaster. With a mission to inspire the best in all people, her work has been featured in many media outlets, including The Today Show, The Oprah Winfrey Show, The View, Larry King Live, USA Today, Los Angeles Times, and many more. In 2011, the Los Angeles County Commission for Women named Kathy Smith Woman of the Year for her work educating communities. She's also recipient of Lifetime Achievement Award from IDEA, the world's largest organization of fitness professionals. She's also a mother of two daughters and lives in Park City, Utah. I get to run into her over at the Whole Foods locally in Park City, and I, she now she's a good friend of mine. On today's show, Kathy Smith shares some top fitness tips to get rid of belly fat. We talk about why belly fat compared to other types of fat is a problem. She shares exercises to do every day, how to scale and personalize your workouts, and nutrition tips to help reduce belly fat. We also discuss changes in fitness trends over the decades and the importance of posture and your built-in Spanx. <laughs> so enjoy the show. On today's show, I have as my guest, guest my friend, Kathy Smith. Welcome to the show, Kathy. Hey, Trevor. Fun to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's great to have you on. And so today we're going to be talking about the best techniques, fitness techniques for getting rid of belly fat. So let's start off by talking about why belly fat compared to other types of other places on our body, why that fat is particularly bad. So what is your take on that, Kathy? Well, first of all, you mentioned it's bad. It's particularly bad. And it, it seems to be impacting more and more women over the years, especially over the age of 40. So the reason why I like to focus on it is because just about every woman that I run across over the age of 40 and sometimes 35 will say to me, Kathy, how do I get rid of belly fat? And especially after you've had babies. And how do you, how do you tighten tone and get rid of that, that belly fat? So cosmetically, people are thinking about it. But when it comes to medically, this is another reason why people should be thinking about this area. Because what we found is that when you put on weight, I mean, if you put on weight in your hips or your legs or the back of your arms, it's not, it doesn't have the same impact on your body as putting it on in your belly. And interestingly enough, the Center for Disease Control just came out with this new study like a month ago that showed that women especially are putting more and more weight in this area. So in the year 1999, 2000, about 50 50% of the women in, in the United States had belly fat. Now in the year 2014, it's 75% of women are kind of dealing with this issue. So I think it's one of these issues that we all should be talking about because it's as you, as you learn today, it's not a one-pronged approach. It's not like I can tell you, do this one thing and it'll disappear. It's a combination of exercise, the type of exercise, it's eating, when you eat, what you eat. It has to do with posture. It has to do through, with movement throughout the day. And these are just some of the topics and, 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 and that I want to get into and even discuss with you a little bit from the standpoint of cortisol and hormones and how that's impacting belly fat. Yeah, that's great. So we're going to go through all of those things. But I want to back up for a minute because I want people to realize what a great history you have of, in fitness, in the fitness world. Because uh, you know, there are a lot of people out there talking about fitness, but Kathy, you've been doing this for a while, and people looking at you aren't going to believe how old you are. So we're not, we don't have to go there, but just so people know how long you've been doing this, can you give us a little background about, about your history getting into fitness, when you started doing all this, and how, you kinda, you know, how this has sort of transformed? 
Yeah, well, that, well, thanks for asking. And it is, it's kind of an interesting story. I was um, in my teens, I lost my father of a heart attack. I was 17 and he was 42 at the time. And I was very close to my dad. As a matter of fact, I look like him and it was, it was just time in my life. Then my mother, a year and a half later, was killed in a plane crash. So those two, those two events happened back to back. And I was about a junior in college at the time. And I started spiraling into this anxiety, a bit of depression, a bit of loneliness. And I just didn't know what I was going to do with my life, especially when you realize that life could be taken away like this. It was like life could be over. And you're kind of thinking, what is the, what is the meaning of life? And this is when, fortunately at the time, I had a boyfriend who was a football player. And I had not exercised at all in my life. I was not an athlete. But I would go to track with him just because I didn't want to be alone. And I would just do one lap and then rest and then do another lap. And I started linking these laps together. And eventually, I ran further and further distances. And I would come back after running a couple miles. And I think, wow. I feel good. I feel confident. I the blood circulating. I feel I feel focused. I feel uh, um, less depressed, and that's what piqued my interest uh, in this whole uh, in, in fitness and this whole idea of what you do with your body affects your mental well being. So that's when I was introduced to uh, to fitness, and that was 1970. To 73. I ran my first marathon in 1975, and then I came to Los Angeles. I went to Los Angeles, and uh, at that point, I was hooked on aerobics, and I started, I just happened to have a, fr a friend who said, you need to go to this class. It was one of the beginning classes. It was 19, again, 75, and Gilda Marks was teaching a class in Century City, and it was... Um, like a lot of arm circles and, and it was uh, like a lot of cross things, calisthenics, you know, no aerobic component. But the interesting thing is Jane Fonda was one on one side, Barbara Streisand on the other. And between the two of these people and uh, this room filled with all kinds of people, I got hooked on the music, the, the class format, the group exercise format, but there was no aerobic component. So I combined my love of aerobics and my love of music and dance. And I com I started teaching a class, got this big following, which led to albums and videos and DVDs. And I don't, I don't want to, you know, I, on another call, maybe go through just the interesting, interesting um, aspect of technology. Actually, I'm going to pause for a second because technology is really important. Just like what we're doing right now, what we're what, the capability of being able to talk to not only you but uh, you know hundreds, thousands, millions, whatever of people in a in a talk right now is mind boggling. You want to you know backtrack like if you went into a time machine and you said, well, let's go back to 1978, and there were no VCRs. You had exercise albums, and there were pictures on the wall you followed along, to, and so. You, it was really fascinating as technology has changed. I've really been interested in how can you motivate people and inspire people using the latest technology as well as the latest uh, fitness and health and nutrition um, and medical advances. So that's been fun. And the whole thing has been through the years, what I've seen is that trends come and go. There's always going to be a new trend. And trends aren't bad. I mean, we had step aerobics and high impact and low impact and, you know, spinning became popular. And then there was Latin dancing and Zumba dancing and there's yoga and Pilates and CrossFit. It's just like one of the things is my whole approach to fitness is it's like a menu. And you, what you pick and choose a lot depends on what do you enjoy doing? What kind of results do you want to get? What is your time schedule like? And, you know, so it's not a one, one thing that everybody has to just think about. It's not a one size fits all. No longer does it have to be. And do we want it to be? There's not one type of exercise, one thing you should be eating. It's a combination. And once you learn to maneuver through this world, it becomes so much fun for the, you know, for the, and it becomes so um, invigorating because You'll find the energy, the vitality, the um, the the confidence that comes when you when you start taking care of this vessel 
I, and I guess, you know, just then circling back to losing my parents, you realize whatever stage of life you're in, um, when you take care of everything else, you just works a little better. Yeah, that's so true. I love everything that you just said. And, and it's so true. If people can just find what they like, whether it's a trend or not, as long as they're doing things safely and we can talk some about that, about form and, you know, being safe and not injuring yourself. But as long as people are doing things safely, they're not overdoing it, and they're, but they're getting in there and they're exercising the right amount. We could talk about that too. You know, as long as people are moving and getting out there and exercising, it, it's all good. And it's, it's important for us to do that, not just for how we look, but how we, for how we feel. And then also preventing health conditions like like, you know, diabetes and, and other conditions that are associated with obesity, heart disease, cancer and types of cancers. We want to reduce our risk for those things by exercising. So let's, um, one other thing I wanted to ask you, you see, you've seen all these trends over the years. And what we're talking about, what we're focusing on today is belly fat. Now, is this a new thing that people have really honed in on? Or have you seen this be a concern the whole time you've been doing fitness? Well, it's a um, two-pronged answer uh, because people have always wanted nice abdominals. When you're, you know, a great strong core and great abdominals. When you're 20, you want to look good in the bikini. Uh, you want to look, you know, you want to look good in your dresses and everything. And when you, the older you get after you have your babies, I mean, right then, that's when you start really noticing, wow, got pregnant how do I get those abdominals back? So abdominals have been a focus throughout the years, but the abdominal uh, strengthening and core training combined now with that belly fat, because before it was like, okay, I can diet a little, I can cut back on my carbs, I can like cut back on my calories for a bit and, you know, cut some fat out, I'll lose some weight and I'll strengthen my core. That kind of was a, no, I'm not saying it was a quick fix, but it sort of worked when you're in your 20s it definitely stops working if you, because it's it, it, uh, when you get to your 30s and 40s and 50s, because you can't jump into anything anymore as a quick fix. I'm going to do this for two weeks and then I'm back and and I'm going to you know continue pizza and pasta and everything else. Which you know there's a, there's now there are now techniques that you're that are just um, that you're going to have to incorporate as part of your lifestyle. So you know when you can have you know, your carbohydrates and you know when you can't have them. And those are things. So I think the focus, uh, because of the aging population, also America is growing up. We're getting more and more, you know, baby boomers that are getting older. And it is this area that has become a focus because, as I mentioned when we first started, 75% of women now have to deal with belly fat. I also think that it, um, it becomes a focus. It's become more of a focus because as you age, your core and your abdominals and this whole core section support your spine. So if you don't have a strong core, what you're going to notice is the slumping. And what from that, you notice the posture. And from that, you notice the back pain. And so all of these go hand in hand. That is, if we're aging, more people are noticing that things are going off in their body. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about posture because I feel like that is so important for strengthening our core, right, and for that belly fat. And, and also to be, like I said, about being safe and not injuring yourself during exercise. Can you talk a little bit about the posture? Okay, so uh, part of I, you know, I'll, I'll talk about things and hopefully uh, it will be appropriate for the audience and it's not too repetitious. And even if it is, I think it, it's, it's good to reinforce. So when you talk about your core, you're talking about everything from your rib cage all the way down through your hips in the front and in the back. So one of the things that we think about, so many times we think about abdominals, but your core wraps around. And I like to think about it as, you know, a built-in Spanx. So when you put your Spanx on, or if you wear Spanx, or in the old days it was girdles, but this idea of what's going to support this area. So you have a bunch of different muscles. And, uh, you know, the, the, the first group that everybody thinks about are the rectus abdominis, and they go from the rib cage all the way down to your pelvis. And those are your crunching muscles. And those create, if you have no body fat, and you work those, those create what we call the six pack across your belly. 
Beyond that, you have what your, your waist muscles or your waist, you know, the, the, the muscles that create your waist. And those are your obliques and they're internal and external. And basically, I don't know if I'm kind of reaching down there, you probably can't see, but if you think about them running along your waist and they go in both directions and they cause this twisting motion. And so anytime you want to twist and pick up a child, a bag of groceries, a, a suitcase, you're using your obliques to then bring it back and, and put it in or lift it up. On the floor, when you want to work obliques, you're going to be doing twisting motions. And then and then you have all the muscles that go along your back, your spinal erectors and all the muscles in your back. And those type of muscles we use by doing what I call Superman. So imagine being on the floor, you lift your chest up off the floor, and you're using those back muscles. But the ones I really want to focus on today with the ones you ask about are the transverse muscles and the transverse abdomina, abdominus. And they go across your back. So they're just a sheet that go across your belly. And you can use them right now by just as we're sitting here, imagine pulling your belly button to your spine. And another way of thinking about it is putting on, if you were putting on a tight pair of blue jeans right now or a tight skirt and the zipper was in front and you had to, you had to pull your belly in a little bit so you won't pinch an inch, those are your transverse. Another way of thinking about it, if I went to cough, if I went... Those muscles right there are your transverse. So one of the things, these muscles are muscles that you can use. You never have to get on the floor to use them. While we're standing, while we're sitting, while you're driving, you can be using them. And the way you practice is just by engaging them, by pulling the belly button to the spine and holding it, and then releasing. And then extend the, extend the contraction. So you pull it in and hold it for 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and then release it. And the more you practice this throughout the day, the more it becomes second nature. So you can practice these uh, on the ground by doing planks and push-up type things, and that engages the, the, the transverse abdominus. So the, but the idea is these are the muscles that keep us, and whenever I'm in a, in a conference or in a seminar, you start, start to see people, and I'm going to do it. I think you can see it here. But if I if I release my abdomen and I'm back here, I'm creating that curvature of the spine, and I'm putting pressure on all of those discs in my spine. Where if if I'm if I'm stacking those discs up in the natural curve of the spine, then gravity isn't pressing on those discs in such a way that it starts to create this wear and tear. And the, you know, I always say that that doing this exercise is like um, the quickest way to lose ten pounds because honestly, you can. Obviously, you're not going to lose ten pounds, but you can. Can lose 10 pounds you can look 10 pounds thinner and one of the things I do when I'm on you know demonstrating people is I show them I take off my top and I just have like a, a tank top on and you know you let it all hang out and that's what happens that's where you see that beer belly lower belly pooch all those things that muffin toppy type of thing that we talk about starts to get created not only with the extra fat but our posture because as we're pressing down on that fat, it pushes it out. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing that. I heard you share that when we were we were speaking at the uh, Waldorf Wellness Weekend. You did that. You did that demonstration. And it was, I found to be very powerful, just showing just the, the change in your posture, how that can make you look different. But also strengthening those muscles is, is going to keep you from getting hurt. It's going to keep you in better alignment if you think about that when you're working out, right? If you keep those transverse abdominus muscles strong, you're probably going to be have better alignment when you're exercising, right? Exactly, exactly. So there's a term now that's being thrown around and it's called midline stabilization. And any exercise that you do, and I don't care if it's a bicep curl, just as you know, a single movement, um, or if it's a compound movement, it's a lunge with the bicep curl, it all starts with the midline stabilization. So before you even think about curling up, you think about engaging. And so, and with those two movements together, you'll start to see, first of all, if you don't have a lot of time, and most of us don't have excessive amounts of time, no, and um, you want to get the most bang for your buck. So when you're exercising, you want to do th these compound movements, or another term is functional movements, where you're working different body parts at the same time. And believe me, you can get in 10 minutes, I'm not exaggerating, I have this video called Fast Fit. 
And it's a DVD that has five 10 minute workouts. And if you give me 10 minutes in the morning doing compound movements, a lunge with an overhead press, you know, a squat with a you know, side lateral raise, these, and, and engaging your core 10 minutes later, you can jump in the shower and you feel like you've, you've worked every muscle in your body. So don't underestimate, first of all, weight training. And we'll get into that, why weight training is important, especially as we age. But weight training and functional training as it relates to belly fat. Because one of the things that, um, that we, tend to, you know, we tend to think about the body as an isolated part. This is my bicep. Oh, I want to work the back of my arm, my triceps. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But our bodies work as a unit. So, you know, when the, this, this bicep also gets engaged when I do an overhead press, which gets the shoulder. And this bicep goes into my shoulder, which goes into my pectoral. And that creates the, the symmetry and that creates that... Um, the, the, the muscle that also creates the muscle that, that is a little bit more metabolically active and uh, that gives you kind of that, that, the lines and the definition that you're looking for. That's great. Okay, so let's talk about, let's go ahead and talk about weight, train, weight training and functional exercise. You mentioned those. Those are really important for getting rid of that belly fat, right? It is, but you know what? Can I start with... I wouldn't mind starting with something called uh, HIT training, okay. high intensity okay. interval training, because uh, this is, um, you know, and, and, and explaining this concept of subcutaneous fat and visceral fat. So to start out with, you know, when, when you look at your body and if you go somewhere and you go to just pinch like uh, a little bit of fat or your, your fat, the fat that's right underneath the skin is called subcutaneous. And that's the fat that's a little easier to deal with. When we get to the belly, we're talking about this visceral fat. Now, visceral fat, if you want to get an image in your mind, if you go to the, the store and you're in the grocery store and you go to the meat department and you look at the steaks there, the, the uh, cuts of steak and you see it marbled, the fat marbled into that muscle. That's more of the visceral fat. It's marbled into your muscles as well as between your organs in your uh, abdominal cavity. So as you start to put on fat, it's not just this fat underneath. It's now being marbled between, you know, the intestines and the stomach and the liver. And, it, and at the same time, it's getting marbled into your muscles. A little bit difficult, more difficult to target this fat. So what the studies have shown that this high intensity interval training, also known as HIT training or burst training, um, is the way to target it. And the good news about burst training, it you can do a, you can do shorter workouts. They're a little bit more intense, and they really help to not only burn fat during the workout, but there's something about uh, that happens after the workout. And this, um, it's called, uh, you know, um, OPEC. And it's basically, it's the type of the, the metabolic burn that happens after you stop training. So it's post-exercise, you know, the post-exercise burn is greater when you're doing this HIIT training. So let's talk about HIIT training. How do you do it? Well, whether you're walking, running, on the elliptical, swimming, whatever aerobic activity you want to choose, you're going to go and you do, you're, you're going to be, do a safe warm up, and I like to do you know a longer warm up. But if you want to do about a five minute warm up, then you start the training and you pick an interval. It could be 90 seconds. It could be six, 60 seconds. Some of the some of the techniques out there, a Tabata training uses 20 second intervals. The longer the interval. It's going to be a little less intense. The shorter the interval, you're going to go at, at, a, at a higher intensity. If you're just starting out with this, I would recommend a longer interval. And I would say something like a 90-second interval that you're going to do, and you're going to now up your intensity from kind of what we call a steady state to where you're going to be pushing a little harder, so where you're out of breath. And when you get to that 90 seconds, you're going to have to pull back, not stop. That's not a stopping, but you're going to pull back and do what we call an active recovery. And now you start alternating 90 seconds on, 90 seconds off, 90 seconds on. And as you start to play with this, and by the way, if anybody's confused about this, you can go to my website, um, 
and I can even send it over to your website, whatever. But we, I can, I can just, guys, you guys can download an interval walking workout, and they can find it right from your, right at your website. And it's just one of these things: a thirty-minute walking uh, slash running interval workout. And w- by incorporating this kind of training into your into your workout, it becomes into your week. It not only makes it more exciting because it breaks the boredom factor, but you will start to notice that it starts to target fat and really this visceral fat. That's great. So we'll have that link on the podcast page on my website so that people can get that and they can they can find out more about this. But just for now, to give an example of like when you say um, you know, do more intense and then less intense. Can you give an example? So say someone is, is, you know, moderately in good shape, you know, not somebody that's super fit, but somebody that's in pretty good shape. They're not new to exercise, but somebody that's moderately looking into doing this, what, what would be a good example? Well, uh, depending if they're wearing, uh, I mean, if you have a heart rate monitor, that's great. If you don't, there's something called the rate of perceived exertion chart. So RPE, rate of perceived exertion. And basically, it's just a scale, scale of 1 to 10. 1 being you're still in bed, 10 being you've maxed yourself out. Typically, we go for our walks, and you're kind of in that 5 or 6 range. It's called a steady state range. And, and, and basically, you're out there, you're comfortable, you might be talking to friends. And I really notice that when people are on the treadmill, they might be watching a TV program, they might be reading, which is like, whenever I see somebody reading on the treadmill, I want to say, stop, you know, because people are going for these long, 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 long reading, and it's long, slow, but instead, it's like you have that five or six, which is that moderate. So now... Start out with your five to, you know, warm up, get to that five or six steady state. And now for the for 90 seconds, pick it up to a seven or eight. Okay, so they'll be, maybe they'll be walking on the treadmill, put down the book, <laughs> and then <laughs> put down the book, and then for 90 seconds, pick it up to a jog. And this is an yeah. example, but obviously an, it, it depends on the person and their level of fitness, and but this will be an example. Jump, or it might be a fast walk. I mean, okay. a, Walking fast, if you don't want to jog, you, this is the program still works. It's just a fast, fast walk, and you're pumping and you're walking, or you might put it on a hill, an incline. Perfect. You know, you, you're on the treadmill and you're at steady state, and now for 90 seconds, you take it up to like a 6% incline. And for 90 seconds, you're pumping that hill up that hill, and then you bring it back down. So we can create the intensity in various ways. It doesn't always have to be the run, it can be, you know, hills, or it can be, you know, a fast walking. Then you pull it back down, and for 90 seconds, you recover. And then you repeat it, and then you repeat it again, and you start with five cycles. Now, you, th- now the thing about interval training is you want to start noticing, f- you know, getting feedback on it. If, if you finished your 90 seconds, and you go, that was a breeze, then the next one, you want, you want to, like, either take it up to an 8% incline or you want to pick up your speed a little bit more. The point being, when you get to that end of that interval, it literally should be like, I have 10 more seconds, 9 more, 8 more seconds. Oh, I get to walk it. It should have that kind of feeling to it. Now, you can start to play around with the length. If 90 feels too long, start with a 60-second interval. And as I said, there are techniques out there now that really go through quick and intense. I just did something this morning, which was a squat, a jump squat series. 20 seconds, jump squat, boom, 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 boom. 20 seconds, hard, fast, recover, 20 seconds. uh, You know, a second set, 10 sets of go, recover, go, recover. And that was literally jump and jump as high as you can in the air, bend, jump as high as you can. I mean, this becomes a little more advanced, uh, but these are type of things where you can start to vary with with these intervals. And so therefore, it isn't a one size fits all. And I would start to experiment. Um, We can talk more about it. We can link. I've written a lot of articles about it. And you can link to those if you want. But I really think that just by offering up uh, and giving an example to somebody so they can get a feel for it, you will get so hooked on interval training. And the results, I mean, I, it, they're just, it, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I tend to go kind of um, far up and saying they're like magical. It's not magical, but it is a thing you got to get out of, I, you know, the study. See, I have people, women that say, I've been walking for the last 10 years. I always go on, you know, 3.5 on the treadmill. And, you know, just, you want to think in your brain, 
your body is not responding to that now. So as much as it's great to do that for, you know, other systems in your body and you might make you feel good, if you're trying to get rid of this belly fat, that's not how you're going to do it. Right. And the, again, that belly fat, that visceral fat that you talked about is really important to get rid of, not just because of the way we look, but because that visceral fat, that fat that's co covering our organs is the riskiest, is the most dangerous of the different types of fat. That's why when people come in to see me saying they want to lose weight, I do a body composition test. And the type of body composition test I do is an electrical analysis because I don't do the pinch test because the pinch test, you know, the one that you, you know you do on the, the backs of your arm or, you know, different parts of your body, that's just looking at the external fat, that fat we have on the outside, whereas there is that visceral fat too. And that's why that's so important because we want to find out both. What do we have? And a lot of people more and more, I think, and especially as we age, we get more of that visceral fat. And so, so what are some other, other things that people can do to help with the belly fat? What else they can do? Well, then we get to, then going back to what you kind of started with or uh, your other question, which was about strength training. So you have a base of HIIT training and then you add on that at least twice a week doing strength training. And strength training, total body strength training, as I was talking about earlier, functional strength training, and then adding specific exercises for this part of the body. Um, I wish it was for, I wish I could, you know, jump up and, and, and or jump down on the floor and, and show you some of these. But once again, um, it's because I have so many fun things. We can also link, I have this, this, this fast fit 10 minute core workout that we can also put on your site and the people and then your your viewers can 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 have it. I mean they can have that 10 minutes of because I can talk about it, but I think the one thing that I that we can talk and I want to give the information, but but it, the other the other main thing is you have to set up a system where you start doing these things on a regular basis. And I really am a big believer of breaking things down into 10 minute chunks because you can do much more. I mean, I can give you, you know, you could do the whole circuit thing twice, but people have excuses not to do things. And the biggest one is soreness, time, uh, not knowing what to do. So I've kind of solved that by giving you 10 minutes st core strengthening exercises where you're working all of the muscles we talked about, not just the rectus. You're not just doing crunches. You're doing the obliques. You're doing the transverse. You're doing the spinal erectors. And now you start to build a base and what you're going to notice after one month of doing that, you're going to notice your posture is going to improve. You're going to activities get affected and you're going to be better at other activities. So you can burn more calories while you're, you know, playing tennis, skiing, walking, running, because you're starting to build a stronger core. The weight training falls in that same category. You want to build muscle. Muscle, you know, I wrote a book called Feed Muscle, Shrink Fat. And it was one of these books that I wrote because I think women really underestimate the power of muscle. Muscle, and in the, and in the book I start out with, muscle is youth. Muscle is vitality. As we age, we lose muscle. So, you know, as you're growing, as you're a teenager and you're growing up here, you're exploding, you're putting on muscle. And anybody that's got kids, boys or girls, you start to see it, that, you know, that, that puberty and on, how they start to fill out. That's the growth spurt in our lives. But honestly, it's not at a, you know, it's not when you get to be 50. At the age of, you know, starting around 30, you start to lose muscle mass. It's imperceptible at first. So you don't really notice it, but it's a little bit, you're just noticing a few little things. But by the time you hit 40, you've lost a bunch of muscle mass. And then if you don't do anything after that, you start to atrophy, your metabolism slows down. But beyond that, everything else in life becomes a little bit more difficult. Running up the flight of stairs, picking up things, and you stop doing things at the same level and having the same energy. Muscle reverses all that. I mean, ha putting muscle on helps to reverse all that. And I, I talk about it helps to reverse the great decline. So what I have is I have a chart and I, I show people, you know, the de great decline starts and you start losing muscle mass. Studies have shown it doesn't have to happen. If you start working on strength training at um, whatever age, and by the way, I, I mentioned the age of 30, but we can reverse muscle, uh, the loss of muscle mass at just about any age. They even did a study at Tufts University where they took women in their 70s 
And within eight weeks of uh, two times a week of strength training, they doubled their strength. So I'm big with muscle. Also remember, we think ex- we think about the muscles on the outside, but so many of our stabilization muscles, of all the muscles that help us with balance, with um, posture, with things we've talked about, are so important. So I, um, I start people on twice a week. Uh, functional exercises to help maintain muscle all over your body, but also you know focusing on core. So I have two two workouts I've talked about today, just to kind of recap what I've talked about. There's a 10 minute core training, and there's another 10 minute total body training. And you know your your viewers can have access to both of those. So just to make it, and then I would just, and then if you have if you have more than that 10 minutes. Do both of them, and now you're to be, you'll have your 20 minute workouts twice a week. And if you can throw in that third day a week, you know more power to you. But definitely at least twice a week. Right. And so I've heard that you need to do at least twice a week. And you said 20 minutes each time, which sounds about right. Twice a week to maintain your muscle mass. And if you really want to improve your muscle mass more, if you want to build more muscle mass, you need to do more than two days a week. And it probably does change a little bit with our age because, like you said, muscle mass, it, it, does, you know, it does decline as we age. And that, that speeds up, can speed up as we age. So we just have to keep up with it with exercise. But how do you feel about that? Do you feel like you need more than two days a week or do you feel like two days is, is good even as we age? Well, the bias toward strength training shifts toward uh, you know, shifts as you get older. So as you get older, you know, every decade you get older, the bias shifts to more strength training and less, and actually less cardio. So it's interesting. Ken Cooper, who was the granddaddy of aerobics, wrote a book probably ten years ago, and he was the one that actually did a lot of the testing on initially on aerobics and then also on aging and and he was the one that started sh- showing that as you age every decade add more and more strength training and that's going to keep your youth and vitality that we talked about but here's the thing i have noticed that there 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 are uh, there are factors involved with how much strength training it's how heavy you're deciding to, to, to train. So remember with strength training, I can pick up a five pound dumbbell. I mean, I, I lift pretty heavy weights now. So if I, I can, you know, bench press 90 pounds and I can do, um, you know, I do deadlifts with, you know, you know, 60 to 80 pounds. And so I can go in and, um, and notice a change in, and, I, and, 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 and well, and notice a change with my twice a week if I'm on the road. Um, but you can't get that kind of change if you're using three pound dumbbells or five pound dumbbells. But it's, so I think you made a really good point, Trevor. Strength training and all the training we're talking about is progressive. And it's one of the things when I did one of my strength training videos, maybe 30 years ago, I talked about what, you know, I talked about one of the most important things with strength training is that once you start it, remember that your body adapts. So you might start with your three pounds and then you're doing those bicep curls, but within about six weeks, you're, there's an adaptation that takes place, which is the good thing. You've gotten stronger. Now you either need to either add a different angle on the bicep curl or add a little bit more weight, or add a few more repetitions. So we start to play around with the frequency, the intensity, and the progression of how are you going to put your exercises together. So if I'm just doing a squat, you know, now I do a squat with a deadlift, or now I do a squat with a deadlift with a lunge, I'm playing around with the progression. So, so therefore, this is why it's fun to start the process and start I like to I like to invite people in because I feel like I, I've always felt like if you give people if you give people too many rules, they are um, yeah, I can't do that. So it's like you know start and you're going to start to notice that you are going to feel better with this, and then as you notice that we can add more and we can start shifting things. But the biggest thing is don't don't get stuck in whatever routine you start this week. It's not going to be your lifelong routine. You want to keep adding, shifting. And that's why programs, that's why, you know, people say, well, why do you have so many DVDs or why do you keep developing programs? And I, and I kind of laugh and I sort of, I compare it to music. You would never go out and buy 
it's funny, I was just in LA and I got to see Stevie Wonder. And, you know, but you'd never go and, and buy a Stevie Wonder album, and that would be the only album you ever bought. It's like you are constantly downloading mu new music, and it's about the variety in music that keeps you interested. Same thing with exercise. It, the variety keeps you interested, but it also keeps things activated, and that's how you start to continue, uh, that's how you make changes and continue to make changes. So, yeah, th think about that because I really do think that getting in programs, whether you decide to hire a personal trainer, whether you decide to do something, you know, um, like a reshape program that I have where I send you a weekly new workouts every single week, whether you decide to have, you know, however you decide to go about it, make sure that you keep um, shifting things at least every six weeks. Right. Great. And, and for people who are feeling overwhelmed, it's just a matter of doing it. Just start getting the habit of doing it because once you start doing it, it gets easier, becomes more of a habit. And it also is, can be really fun. I took my daughter, my 13 year old daughter to, to work out with me with my personal trainer, a uh, friend of mine a few days ago, and she was dragging, she didn't want to go, and then when we got there, she had a blast, because we made it fun, he made it fun, and with the, we, we, we did one where we were on the BOSU ball, and we were um, doing um, ab works, and ab work, we had a ball, the ball, and we'd pass it back and forth to each other, or we'd stand yeah. on the BOSU ball, and we'd bounce it back and forth to each other, we just, you know, he made it fun for us, you can make strength training, you can make fitness fun, and I know, Kathy, I know you're great at doing that, in fact, I just want to say that, um, you know this, but I want to share with the audience that the first time I saw Kathy was when I was pregnant with my now 15-year-old son, and I did your workout video as a pregnancy workout video. <laughs> that was the first time I ever saw Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> That was so much fun. I get that so much from people also. I was just, again, traveling. And so many women come up and, and, and we shared that time together, which I think, you know, I was pregnant with the when I was shooting the video and in the video. And at the end, we kind of, all of us in the video were pregnant. We showed, you know, the babies and uh, we had a post-pregnancy kind of party afterwards. So it was a fun time. And it was fun to connect with women at that time because it's another, it's a shared experience. And I feel like we're kind of going through that same kind of experience now. Women are going through, just like we shared that pregnancy time together. People, women are sharing this other time of, okay, I'm noticing shifts in energy, shifts in vitality, belly fat, you know, not maybe having the confidence I had and wanting to talk about it, wanting to, um, wanting to shift. And I think that's what I, I, what I love about what you're doing, Trevor, with programming and even bringing me on to talk about this subject is that this is the this is the beginning this is just the beginning of the discussion and the discussion continues and what I love is to get feedback from people on on on, on what's working what's not working and sharing stories because that's how we shift from 75 percent of the women have belly fat to back to 50 to down to 30 I mean I think it should, we should make it a goal for all of us to to shift this pattern because it's actually more pronounced in women than men and so I think it's something that you know all of us should share in in helping each other not only with the exercise and we haven't talked a lot about food but you know I I don't want to neglect that topic because and I mean maybe we can uh, come back at another time and just have a whole food talk because I think that um not I think they they both go hand in hand and actually Food is slightly more important than the exercise. So we want to make sure that we don't forget the fact that um, what you put in the mouth is becomes um, um, you know more important as we age, but is really has a huge impact on this on this belly fat issue. It's so true. I see people. You know, we live in a very Kathy. You and I both live in Park City, Utah, and it's a very fit community. And I, when patients come in to see me that live in Park City, a lot of times they're very fit. They're very active, and but they haven't necessarily been watching what they eat. And then as they get older, especially, they start to notice why is it that I can't? Why am I gaining weight? Why is it that? I'm still exercising. Why is it that I can't get the same results? And part of it is what we're eating. It does catch up with us at some point. And of course, even when people are younger, they should be eating healthy, but it does catch us up, up with us more as we age. And then I see people then come in with high cholesterol, high blood pressure, 
um, you know, they're pre-diabetic or maybe diabetic. So these are the things that can happen if we don't watch our nutrition in addition to our exercise. So they're both really important. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And, and yes, maybe, maybe you should come back and we should talk about that. But is there anything like one, you know, or two like quick little tips on nutrition that I know it's a big topic, but is there anything that you would say that's the number one thing? Well, um, number one, I would say refined foods. I mean, I would say refined carbohydrates and just, I mean, the more you can think about shopping the perimeter, getting your fresh produce, getting all those colorful vegetables in your, in your cart, um, uh, going for the, uh, you know, the non starchy, even vegetables. So not necessarily your potatoes, your sweet potatoes. And if you're going to eat those, you know, how you're going to cycle through those, but, but you want your broccolis and your kales and your spinaches and finding great ways to, to make these, these dishes so that your family loves them. And then you go around and having, you know, your fruits for dessert and having, you know, really going to, um, like I, I, I love, um, you know, even with apples and, and doing baked apples and something if you want to go for a dessert. But then, you know, around the, you know, you go for your, your fresh, your fish, your lean cuts of meat, chicken, you know, around and even with, um, you know, when you head over to, you know, the basis for, I'm big into protein shakes and for, for the protein shakes, I like, uh, I like almond milk, I like your, you know, coconut waters, coconut milk, um, and, 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 you know, finishing off with just, you know, the, the, the eggs and, and, you know, with the dairy, there's, you know, a little bit, we'd have to go into detail about, you know, which dairy is better. But I think what, what I would say is that you shop the perimeter and when it comes to the aisles, there's just too many things that are pulling you in that that uh, that really that really are the culprits when it comes to belly fat. So it's learning how do you like how do you uh, uh, sub start substituting the things you would normally get in those aisles. So I think that's the idea is carbohydrates. Um, uh, sugars. I mean, sugar. You know, I love chocolate, and I'm I will never give up my chocolate. But I've really learned how that that deep dark chocolate, that seventy five percent, you know, um, uh, dark chocolate, uh, and um, and. And when I have that, I really balance that with my proteins throughout the day. And then I think the other thing is, is how do you space your meals so that there's a good amount of time between when you go to bed to when you have your first meal the next day so that, that you, you give your body time to, you know, process and metabolize things. And I think what we do is when we, when we are late night eaters, um, I, this is one that I had to shift for myself you know, late night snacker. And um, because I started to notice my, you know, I was gaining some weight around my belly. And honestly, it was literally shifting out of my late night snacking and finding ways of how do I, you know, how do I have a cup of tea, something that's warm, you know, that that I can like sip on because it's, it's part of it is just having something, a ritual to do. And you finish your dinner, you make sure that you have a, you know, a nice, you know, a, a good, you know, source of protein, some good fats throughout the day. And if you eat your fats earlier from avocados and, and fish and seeds and nuts and you, and you, and you balance those, you eat them, you're not going to be overly hungry at night. So eating, cutting off the late night eating. And then what I basically am doing, and I would love to come back and talk more carb cycling. And it's how do you take your carbohydrates and there's certain days if you're working out more, you allow yourself more carbohydrates. If you're sitting more, if I'm going to be in a plane and I'm not going to eat as many, but in general with the belly fat, I have low, medium and high carbohydrate days, you know, low, medium. And I tend to keep my low, medium days, um, you know, though it's going to be most of the week, then you're going to have a higher carbohydrate days, So you can stay, you can stay engaged with your, with your social life. Cause if you, if you, what I have noticed, if you get so fanatical that you can't have a social life, you're not going to stick to a program. So there's great programs out there that are great in the beginning, but they're not long lasting because it's like, okay, well, I can never have a piece of pizza again. And so my thing is write down three things that you know you cannot live without. 
It could be pizza, pizza, it could be pasta bolognese, it could whatever it might be for you, could be Doritos. If you know you can't live without those or life will not be worth living, then let's find ways that you can have those, you know, throughout the month and um and and make a make 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 a an eating plan that works for you. But you know, you're the you're the queen of all this and you're the one that you know helps people do this. And I'm just, you know, supporting people on a weekly basis to start making shifts into higher protein, good fats, less refined carbohydrates, and um, all those great vegetables, and how do we make, and, and giving them recipes so that we can now create a meal plan that you look forward to. And that's where I'm at, and, and that's where my family's at, and my relatives, my friends, really, we're sharing all these great menus, like, oh my gosh, did you taste that? That was incredible. And when you get to that, it becomes so much easier, because it's not like about not having it's not what I can't have. It's what I get to have. And I get to have all of these, like, you know, chocolate mousse, but it's made with avocado. And, you know, do, you know, so you're getting the good fat with the chocolate. Oh, absolutely. I hear you. I love food. I love to eat. So I wouldn't want to deprive myself at all. But I, it's really about the quality of food that we choose to eat and the balance, like you were talking about. So, but thank you so, thank you so much, Kathy, for all your information on fitness and nutrition. And, and I know I'll be seeing you in the Whole Foods in the perimeter of the store <laughs> where I usually run into you. <laughs> With my cart. <laughs> yes. up for my smoothies <laughs> and my salads. Anyway, great, Trevor. And, you know, to everybody out there, I, uh, you know, I love this woman. I love what she, I love Trevor and what she is uh, doing with, you know, making impact on the world. And so I'm here to support anybody out there in any way that I can to uh, so that everybody can be belly fat free and just leading an energetic life. Great. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Kathy Smith. For more information about Kathy and to get access to some of her great workouts, you can visit my website, drtrevorcates.com, and visit the podcast page with her interview. Thanks again, and have a great day.